Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, legend of the A-League and current Western United goalkeeping coach, Michael Theo. Thank you so much for joining me, Michael. Thanks for having me, Shan. We'll start with the standard question I ask every guest on. How did your love and passion for football first start? Yes, so uh, it was the World Cup, Italia 90, uh, watching that in Italy, uh, particularly Walter Zengo, who was the Italian national goalkeeper at the time. Um, so, yeah, I sort of fell in love with the sport then, obviously watching it early hours of the morning. And then uh, I'd have a friend of mine who would kick a ball around. And, um, yeah, I wanted to be Walter Zenga. I remember buying his uh, boots and gloves. I was all decked out eventually when I started playing at club level. So, um, yeah, that, that was my real first love of the game. That's uh, how it all began. Now, I've interviewed a fair few goalkeepers, and I think every single goalkeeper I've interviewed has told me that they started their career playing a position that wasn't goalkeeper. So do you fall into the same category, or were you always a goalkeeper? No, I was a goalkeeper from day one. So, yeah, going back to then, as I said, with my mate and I would have a kick on the streets, and I remember uh, I grew up in Melbourne, so a, a suburb called Richmond. So, um, yeah, my mate would shoot at me, and I remember we had a garage door. Obviously, I'd be diving around being the goalkeeper, as obviously it was just him and I. And then we decided to join a club together. At, uh, it's called East Richmond Jaguars. And, and they asked me, oh, what position do you play? And I said, oh, I'm a goalkeeper. So from day one, I've been in goals. I don't think I've been uh, much of a runner, Shannon. So uh, I think it was more to do with that. I was, I was one of the smarter ones, I think. So on to your professional career. Um, you got your first taste of professional football back in the NSL with South Melbourne. So when you first joined South Melbourne, you know, being such a big club, with big following, did you feel an enormous pressure or was it just like, you know, nothing nothing new for you? Look, for me, I, I grew up supporting South Melbourne. So I remember going to the good old Middle Park days, let alone Albert Park, where they are currently are based out of. So I had that affiliation with South Melbourne. And um, yeah, I remember going with my brother and watching them play. So um, yeah, it was always a club that I admired and supported. And when the opportunity arose to obviously go in, I went in as an injury replacement. Um, so one of the goalkeepers went down and I had an eight week stint there where I was the uh, reserve goalkeeper and obviously trained with the first team. And I think that was the first time I really felt to myself like, okay, this is definitely what I want to do. Uh, I've got to experience uh, the likes of training with Michael Pekovic at the time, who was an absolutely superstar. Um, just the way he conducted himself and the way he went about it, you know, got to travel uh, interstate and, and um, you know, you know, stay away at hotels you know, as a 19, 20 year old. It was a bit of a novel novelty. So um, yeah, that, that's where I really got my first taste and thought, no, no, this is something definitely I want to pursue. And thankfully I ended up having a half decent career in terms of longevity as well. So um, yeah, that's how it all started. You also had another stint in the NSL this time with New Zealand based club Football Kings. Many people probably wouldn't have heard of them because unfortunately, you know, it was a bit of an ill-fated club. So for you at the time, it was around the time where the NSL was sort of dying out, being at one of these clubs that wasn't doing so well. What was that whole experience like? Was it a bit like detrimental or were you just happy that you were getting consistent minutes? Yeah, for me, it was, it was the last year of the NSL. So um, I was 20 at the time and Michael Peterson was the head coach. So he was previously at South Melbourne and then he went across to New Zealand and, and brought a few players across and I happened to be one of them. So for a 20-year-old to be thrown sort of in the deep end, um, as you said, it wasn't a, a successful year we had. We, we finished bottom, but for a young goalkeeper having plenty to do, for me, if anything, it was a positive. Um, as much as you know, obviously you want to be involved in team success but um, to be a youngster and be thrown in the deep end and face plenty of shots um, yeah I really learned a lot about myself and you know being in a difficult environment and um, yeah that sort of held me in good stead throughout my career after it. And then you moved on to Blackpool which you know is a pretty more well-known club to Australian fans so just how did that move to Blackpool come along? Yeah again like had I not played in the old NSL um, you know for me, I did not not bad considering the, the team uh, didn't do too well overall, but I, I did get a move to, to Blackpool. And again, it was great to experience the, the UK football, what it's about, because um, it's very, very different to here. You know, even like comparing it to other codes like AFL, obviously 
uh, Australians are fanatical with it. But I think once you move there, it's uh, AFL times 100. That's how passionate they are about it. It's just a completely different beast. So to have that experience as a 20-year-old, it was a bit of an eye-opener, which was great. Um, so, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I was, I was there for a year and uh, learned a lot. And as I said, you know, being away from home, you know, out of your comfort uh, you know, being out of your comfort zone as well. And I suppose having that experience in New Zealand really helped because that was obviously, uh, you know, played a year there. I was away from home, but uh, it's not the other side of the world. So it sort of held me in good stead, uh, you know, experiencing that and then moving on to Blackpool. Now, I think where you first started to make a real sort of name for yourself in Australian football was when A-League started, signed for Melbourne Victory. But Melbourne Victory um, had a bit of a strange situation with the goalkeepers. They had yourself, they had Eugene Galekovic, two very, very good goalkeepers. And it almost seemed like every match they were rotating you and Eugene. So for you, what was it like having such strong competition for your spot being a goalkeeper when, you know, this league has just started? Yeah, you're right. It was a bit of a weird one. Mind you, Eugene and myself, our our careers have overlapped quite often. Um, Even going back previously to that, I played for Bulleen... uh, Lions, who were in the BPL, the Premier League here. And Eugene was a goalkeeper there. And um, he actually uh, got injured. He, he did his knee. So he had a knee reconstruction. And um, I ended up going to Borlean, uh, obviously, because Eugene was out. So our, we sort of crossed paths there. And then Eugene moved on the following year once he uh, recovered. And then the last year of the NSL, sorry, was uh, at South Melbourne. So it was Eugene and myself. Again, I went in as an injury replacement because uh, Dina Sosiatis was the other keeper. He got injured and I ended up staying the whole year, which again, I was with Eugene. Uh, Eugene went away with the um, Ollie Ruse at the time. So I played like five, six games uh, on the bounce. And then obviously the following year, uh, the A-League was forming. So we all went away. Um, I went to, again, back to my team in the uh, Victorian Premier League in Berlin, and Eugene went overseas to Portugal. And then to be back at Melbourne Victory for the inaugural A-League season, um, yeah, it was, it was weird how it worked. But, um, yeah, Ernie Merrick was the coach, and he obviously had worked with uh, Eugene at uh, the VIS. And uh, Gary Cole had worked with myself at um, Berlin. He was my coach there. So... Yeah, for Ernie, it was a bit hard for him to split the both of us. And, um, you know, VIS days, a lot of them, that's what they did. They played the keeper for two or three games and the other goalkeeper would play. So it was difficult because you couldn't get that continuity with the the back four uh, and whatnot. So that happened a few times. We rotated and then Eugene had a bit of a go in it. And then that first year, I then played the back half of the the year. So, um, yeah, it was interesting to say the least. But uh, in the end, it all turned out okay for myself. So after a pretty successful stint with you at Melbourne Victory, you attracted interest from overseas, moved to Norwich City, a pretty big move for yourself. So firstly on that move, just how did it come about? Yeah, well, I spent the first four years uh, of the A-League playing for Melbourne Victory and in that time frame, I had won two uh, A-League championships as well with the club. And I was getting at that age, I believe I was 27 or 28 uh, by this stage. And I thought, you know what, uh, the UK, I really wanted to give it a, a good crack. I had a taste of it uh, when I was younger, as a 20-year-old. And I thought now I was sort of coming into my prime. So, um, yeah, it was just, I was coming out of contract at Melbourne Victory. There was a bit of interest from some overseas clubs and Norwich City was one of them. I, I went and trialled and uh, did particularly well and then um, secured a contract there. So that's how that move sort of came about. And unfortunately, sometimes in life and football, things just don't work out. Um, Norwich was a bit of a story of that for yourself. Now, I think 10, 10 or so years later, looking back on it with, you know, wiser head on your shoulders, with all the experience of your career, just what do you make of that whole experience at Norwich? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I can't believe it's been 10 years, Shannon. But um, look, for me, I'm a big believer. Everything happens for a reason. Uh, it was meant to happen. I always wanted to, to play in, in Europe, play in the UK. And for whatever reason, it wasn't meant to be in terms of me playing there uh, for, yeah, for a consistent period. Um, yeah, the first day, uh, debut, you know, we lose 7-1 to Colchester. Um, everything that could have gone wrong <laughs> went wrong. Um, obviously, the goalkeeper's a scapegoat when you lose 7-1. Um, and then to make things worse, the opposition coach ends up being our coach, who was uh, Paul Lambert. So, um, yeah, after that, it was quite difficult. I was, I was in, the, uh, yeah, in the bad books, to say. But, again, you, know, you learn a lot about yourself, your character, 
uh, you know, when the going gets tough. And, and I think that experience really made me the person I am and, and just that real, I suppose, uh, you know, could have thrown in the towel, could have been easy to do, but it wasn't the case. Um, you know, I worked extremely hard, got my body right. Um, you know, it, it was tough. I'm not going to lie there. At, at stages, it was very, very tough. But again, that helped mold me into the person I am and I'm way better off for that experience and you know that led me to the next chapter which I'm sure we'll discuss which was you know coming back home to Australia but to Brisbane Raw so yeah as I say one door closes another one opens and um, yeah it's, it's funny how football works. Well let's discuss that next chapter since you just mentioned it Brisbane Raw obviously incredibly successful while you were there um Ange Postacoglu pretty much masterminded a team playing incredible football. Um, so we hear a lot of stories in the media and all this sort of thing about what Ange Postacoglu is like to manage a player, but we don't really know unless we're players. So for you having played under Ange, just what is he like? Is he how he's portrayed in the media or is he a completely different person? Look, for me, Ange has got the, the man management skills where I think he brings a whole squad along uh, for the journey. Everyone's got buy-in. Uh, he's got certain ways he wants to do things and certain playing style. So everyone's on the same page. There's no deviating. Um, it's We're all in it together. And, yeah, the biggest thing I'd say is he has buy-in from the group. Um, yeah, just the way he motivates players, um, you know, builds confidence and – he did particularly well uh, in Brisbane because I think he brought in players that were hungry, had a point to prove, could play to the style that he wanted to play. And that's why I think we did have that success. Um, yeah, as I said, like, oh, I can only speak highly of Ange and it's fantastic to see what, you know, what he's gone and done and achieved so far, you know, with the Soccer Roos and obviously now, you know, Japan, you know, winning the, the J League and now doing so well at Celtic. Um, yeah, he's just fantastic. Um, yeah, as I said, he's set in his ways. There's no deviating to the game plan. He wants you to play a certain style. And um, yeah, as I said, he gets everyone to buy in. And, and that's what I find makes a difference because uh, it's hard. And especially now, um, you know, it's a lot different to when I grew up and yeah, players are different. Obviously social media plays a big part now. Um, you know, I was a little bit old school in that regard, you know, um, whereas now you have to change as a manager as well. You sort of have to be, you know, you have to be firm when you, 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 know, you have to be, but then also, you know, uh, you got to be not, not friends with players. It's just like, a, it's different. As I said, you know, you, you got to be, you know, how's everything? You're well outside of football. You've got to be on top of everything. Whereas back in the day, it was, you know what, we come there, you do your business, you do your work and, and you go home. Whereas now I think you have to be over everything. Um, and that's just how it is, um, you know, to get the best out of everyone. Um, you got to make sure that, um, yeah, they're looking after themselves. And and because obviously that translates to on the field as well. So, um, yeah, as I said, I can't speak highly enough of Ange, what he's achieved and, yeah, that those four years that I spent uh, at Brisbane and, you know, two years with him, he, he really changed the landscape of football in this country. I think, too, one of the um, biggest memories that a lot of people have about Brisbane Roar in that era, probably one of the most iconic, if not the most iconic moments in A-League history, was that grand final against Central Coast Mariners. Two goals down and Brisbane Roar clawed their way back. Last minute winner, last minute equaliser, sorry, from Eric Pardalou. But for you as a goalkeeper, seeing all that unfold, thinking, you know, that you've lost this match and you've drawn it back, all of a sudden you're going to go have to face penalties. Just what is going through your mind in that moment? Steam of the A-League era. And it goes. Yeah, look, it was a tough one because I think that uh, year we only lost one game. It was actually to Melbourne Victory away from home. We lost 3-0 and we considered a few goals playing out from the back. And uh, to Andrew's credit, he really st stood strong in terms of, no, that's fine. We're going to play out. If we concede a goal, I'll wear it. But we're, we're not changing the way we play. And by him doing that, I think it led all the way through in terms of even grand final we didn't change. Um, you know, there was an opportunity there. I, you know, we were two one uh, down. I remember I had the ball in my hands, and I was deciding: do I go long? Don't I? Because there's only you know thirty seconds left. I was arming and ahhing, but I said no, no. I'm going to stick to the principles. It's playing out, so I actually threw the ball out, 
and then we went up on the field and we won a corner from that play. So again, it's decisions making and sticking to your structures. And um, because we had that instilled in us, you know, the belief that no, no, no matter what the minute is, you know, we're sticking to our structures. And we won the corner, we ended up scoring from that. So all of a sudden, you know, being 2 0 down, thinking, oh, yeah, I can't believe, you know, we've lost the big one. Um, we've scored in every game, basically. And, you know, we were not going to score in the grand final. And then, yeah, to equalize, I think we had all the momentum going our way. Obviously, being a goalkeeper as well in a penalty shootout. Um, yeah, I sort of fancied myself to save a penalty or two. So, um, yeah, to obviously had saved two uh, penalties, and one was against Daniel McBreen. Uh, yeah, Daniel's giving me a bit uh, during the game. You know, they'll tune all up and wasting a bit of time. And uh, yeah, we had a bit of an incident. I think he collided into me and um, yeah, there was a few words exchanged. And then uh, when he stepped up, uh, I was uh, yeah really pumped to save his penalty. But yeah, for me, that was my greatest sporting moment in my career. Um, you know, every grand final you win special and unique. But for me, the way the circumstances are say like... Uh, there were probably ten or 15,000 people that left the stadium because they thought, no, it's over. It's 2 nil down. But no, no, we, we stuck to our guns. And um, to prevail in that, it'll, for me, it goes down as the all-time uh, you know, greatest day league grand final. And Michael Theopatos with a bit of experience in saving penalties in grand finals. He did so for Boleyn many years ago in the Victorian State League. And he saved one already. Another one. And Brisbane... We're almost there. Petrovic. He saved again. Michael Theokletos. Brisbane Raw are almost there. And it's going to be the slippery fish, Simon. He marches his way to what is shaping up as being the decisive penalty of the sixth season of the Hyundai A-League. And that is Mark Schwarzer-esque. Australia, Uruguay, 2005. Schwarzer did it, albeit going the other way. Theoklatos has taken one out of the great man's copybook. And now it's the slippery fish. Bilakinho, Enrique, to win the title for Brisbane. One kick separating Brisbane Raw from their second trophy of the season. Enrique against Ryan. It's all on this. Enrique scores! Brisbane are the champions! And who'd have thought we'd have been saying that some 10 minutes ago? What an incredible comeback! What an incredible team this Brisbane Raw side is! It's Brisbane's day! It's Brisbane's season! It's Brisbane's time! And Postacoglu's team claim the championship to go with the Premiership! Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you're now Western United's goalkeeper coach, so I'll get onto that in a moment. But for your playing career, when it was starting to wind down um, and you knew that, you know, you couldn't do this anymore and you had to give it up, how hard was that for you to, you know, give up essentially this dream that you've achieved and lived for all these years? Yeah, great question, Shannon. Look, for me, I was one of the fortunate ones. You know, I started playing when I was 20 professionally and I retired. I was 38, so I had an 18-year career. And um, for a long period there, I had a great run of uh, being injury-free. But the last year or two, um, you know, I remember fracturing my wrist a couple of weeks before the start of the season. And then I was out for three months. And then after that, when I did come back, I started sustaining, you know, quad injuries, calf injuries, things like that. Um, so, yeah, overall, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I had a, a very, very uh, fortunate run, um, had a lot of team success, but you've always got to think of life after football. And for me, I really started that when I arrived in Brisbane. Uh, at the time, I, I believe I was uh, 30, yeah, probably no, 29, 30 years of age. And I started my own soccer academy, uh, both for goalkeepers and outfield players. So I got that taste um, of, you know, of, it was a way of me giving back, um, you know, mentoring the next generation. And if I could help them through my experiences, um, you know, it was great. And, you know, growing up, I never really had any goalkeeper specific coaching until my late teens. Um, it was a bit of a weird one. It was sort of like, okay, you're the goalkeeper going goals and we'll just move a few balls at you. So it's a specialized position and it's unique. So you need to start at a young age. So for me, I was always, um, you know, coaching was 
something that I'll, I suppose, lead into. And it sort of has worked out that way. So, yeah, finishing up in terms of my playing career, I always knew I'd be involved in the game. Um, it's given me so much and it was a way of me giving back to the game. So, um, yeah, it wasn't as hard a transition as some people find it. And obviously, as, as I've mentioned now twice, Western United's goalkeeper coach, um, you've only just started that role this season. So how have you enjoyed it so far? Yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, look, uh, I've, I've been a part of such a uh, professional environment for so long. And then I even got a, a chance to play uh, you know, NPL here in Victoria. So I was coaching and playing there as well, getting a taste of you know, football again at you know, semi-pro amateur level, uh, which was great. And um, now that I've been back in that professional environment, it, it's fantastic. It's what I've known for so long uh, to, to work with you know, fantastic goalkeepers, um, just to motivate them. To it, It's a different side of the game. As I said, as a player, all you worry about is yourself in terms of getting your body right, your performance right, and obviously collectively as a team. But as a coach, uh, you know, you're, you're planning, you're doing video analysis. It's very, very different. You know, you're, you're seeing the overall collective, whereas as a player, you're probably a tad selfish, um, but in, in a good way, yeah? Like you have to be because, you know, your lifespan as a professional player is short and you've got to make sure that you're on top of your game. And it's not like, you know, I go into work for two hours, train and I'm done. It's no, no, you're a professional athlete 24 hours a day. So that's, you know, nutrition, hydration, sleep, um, you know, stresses of playing. It's, it's very, very important. And coaching, it's a different element. Um, there's a lot of preparation, a lot of thought that goes into it a lot of video analysis, opposition, obviously, the, you know, the goalkeepers that I work with. Um, and, yeah, I'm just loving uh, that side of it and, you know, being in that uh, environment again. And um, as you've mentioned, like, incredible players and all that sort of thing at Western United, a player who you actually know from your playing days joined Western United at a similar time as you did, Jamie Young. So do you think having that prior, um, you know, rapport with Jamie Young has sort of helped you step into the role a little bit? Or is it a bit strange considering, you know, this is your former teammate. Now you're going to have to pretty much <laughs> tell him what to do and how to train. Yeah, look, to be fair, I think it's a positive. Um, having worked with Jamie, I know what he's about. He knows how I operate. Um, but, yeah, in saying that, it, it's been great. There's no dramas there. I'm not one of those coaches, well, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. It's pretty open-minded. I think I'm... I'm that sort of character anyway. Um, if anything, I want to get the best out of Jamie. I want to get the best out of Ryan Scott, you know, the younger goalkeepers coming through. It really is a union. Um, it's funny. It's the, it's not like I, as a player, as I say, you, you can only control what you can do. But as a coach, I'm trying to create an environment where everyone thrives and they're part of the collective. So when we do have a clean sheet, it's not like, oh, Jamie Young had a clean sheet. It's collectively we had a clean sheet. You know what I mean? It's, it really is. It's, it's a weird one, the, the goalie union. As you know, obviously one plays, one's going to sit on the bench. You know, there might be a third goalkeeper that misses out. That's just the nature of the beast. But it's funny uh, throughout my whole playing career and even like coaching, uh, you know, I've seen it's such a strong, unique group of people. Um, I think there's obviously that neutral respect of what we do. We re push you know, each other hard, but ultimately we know that you know, one's going to play and you've got our full support, whoever's playing. It's their job to keep the jersey. Uh, but in saying that, you know, obviously if you don't perform to your ability, then there's someone there knocking on the door too. So yeah, it's a weird one. But um, yeah, as I said, I think my character and having had that experience playing with Jamie and knowing what he likes, um, you know, and you know, trying to get the best out of him, it, it's, it's worked out well so far and I don't see it uh, changing anytime soon. And now with 2021 nearly over, um, thankfully for some people, for 2022, what is Michael Theo hoping to achieve? What can we expect to see from Michael Theo in the future? Yeah, for, for me, I said it's the next chapter is post playing. It's it's coaching, and uh, I really want to develop as a coach. Um, even though I've had my academy and I've done a fair bit of coaching already, this is sort of a new new era. It's you know, you know obviously training, working with the the men's team, the A League boys. Um, for me, it's just really developing them, developing human beings. It's it's not just the the football. It's the character, the people. Um, you know, you want to be surrounded by good people. Um, you know set a certain work rate mentality all those sort of things you know it, it's um yeah for me it's just being a part of a collective and, and achieving something special and uh at this stage it's with western united and uh you know hopefully we can have some silver yes sharing some of that uh, silverware 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's a different one. As I said, as a player, it was different now at the coaching perspective. I think it might be a, a lot sweeter as well. Well, hopefully 2022 is a success for you. But thank you so much for joining me today, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, cheers, Shannon. Thanks for having me. And it's good to reminisce, go over the stories because uh, I tell you what, when you're in it, it's hard. You, you sort of uh, have a bit of team success and then you're like, okay, I've enjoyed that. Now it's the next thing, you know, next year moving on. So I think you appreciate it once you finish playing. You go, you know what, we actually did succeed. We did have a lot of success, team success, and you appreciate it more. Whereas as I say, when you're in it, it's okay. We're moving on, next thing now. So um, yeah, it's been good to obviously revisit uh, some positive, some negative not negative, some uh, moments that uh, didn't go according to plan, but uh, definitely uh, molded me to be the person that I am today. So, uh, no, no, very, very fortunate to be a part of our special code. Thank you for watching. This video is sponsored by Arrow Sport. Go to the link in the description and the friendly team at Arrow Sport will help you create your own football dream jersey. Whether it's starting from scratch or using one of their many templates on their website, creating a jersey with Arrow Sports is easy and prices start from just $50. Go to www.arrowsport.com.au and make your football kit dreams become a reality.